people tend to think that when the heart stops beating and the last breath is taken, it's end of story. But in some ways, I think it's the beginning of the story. Hello, passionate listeners and watchers. Welcome to Passion Harvest. I am Louisa, your host. Thank you so much for joining me wherever you are in the world right now. Our guest today is Felicity Warner. We all die, but there are good deaths and not so good deaths. Felicity Warner created the idea of soul midwifery for the dying after sitting with many hundreds of people at the end of life. Her pioneering work over the last 25 years has brought a new dimension to holistic, spiritual, palliative care. Felicity is a respected lecturer, teacher and author of four acclaimed books. This is her story and this is her passion. Felicity Warner, welcome to Passion Harvest. I'm so excited to have you on the show today. Oh, Louisa, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, it's, it's really great to be here. Oh, it's a pleasure. So let's get started. You've got such a wealth of information and um, it's, I'm sure it's of particular interest for the audience. I'm going to start straight to it. What happens when we die? Wow, that is a great <laughs> question to start with. <laughs> I will give you my best answer. What happens when we die? A lot, uh, a lot happens when we die. You know, people tend to think that when the heart stops beating and the last breath is taken, it's end of story. But in some ways, I think it's the beginning of the story, or at least it's it's the, the circle coming right round again from birth and then right round. Death and birth mirror each other so much and are both doors um, opening onto a sacred threshold. So when we die, and I have now sat with, well, hundreds of people as they have died and at that moment of death, the first thing that I notice and I honour is the fact that something extraordinary and something very sacred is happening. So it's as if the energy in the room completely changes, it completely shifts. Sometimes it's experienced as a void or a vacuum. It can feel almost as if the life force around you has been sucked out while this, mm. this energy comes in. Um, but there is a very noticeable shift um, as soon as someone dies. I, I see it as if they have slipped into a deep slumber, but they're still just sort of sinking, sinking, sinking. Um, they haven't quite reached the bottom of that slumber yet. And I think that is a process that takes a little while to happen. So it's not an instant thing. And also it's a variable thing. So people take their time and they do it slightly differently. But what I think they are doing, and I've seen this now from, from being in the room, from being with um, colleagues in busy settings where death is almost being ignored because there are too many other things going on around for people to be sitting and tuning in with acute awareness as I'm often privileged to do. What I see happening is, is a gentle settling within that person. And then eventually when the settling is has calmed a bit like ripples on a water mm -hmm. when they've actually just flattened out i then see the separation of two very distinct energies and so i describe those as the energy of spirit and the energy of soul and at this certain time when those ripples have flattened and when the time is right and the time is always right for that person, there will be this separation taking place. So I see spirit um, leaving the body in a clockwise direction, 
going upwards and I see the soul energy in an anti-clockwise direction usually going downwards but sometimes it's a, a horizontal a drawing away of these two energies and that for me is the most sacred time of the whole dying process because until that has happened the person is still really with a foot in two worlds but when that separation has taken place they have truly um, uh, transitioned and gone into the next stage of the journey so that's what i see at point of death how incredible and when you say see it you see it with your physical eyes or your mind eyes or your how is that experienced uh, for you it it does vary but more and more i see it with my mind's eye with with my third eye mm -hmm. um i i see it using my inner vision um and i can see it quite distinctly and physically as these two spirals spiraling away from each other uh sometimes i just feel it and there again it's a, a connection with the with the energetics that are going on um it didn't happen that I was always able to see it. It came after um, many years of sitting with dying people before I actually saw it with my with my inner eye. But um, it's interesting because I work with other colleagues. I, I train many other people to do this work now. And collectively, I think we have a field that we operate within, a, an energetic field. And collectively, many, many more of us are actually seeing this um, unbinding of spirit and soul, which is very, very special incredible and there's probably no time frame and it's individual for each person what sort of time frame after the we turn out the physical body dies do you see this separation take place sure generally it will happen within three days and that is general most people are within the three days some people it happens almost immediately so there will be death there will be the slowing down and then straight away well within an hour or so maybe less but generally it's around three days which is very interesting when you um uh correlate that with um you know many of the world's great religions have this sort of reverence of the three days mm -hmm. um uh you know for instance you know um christ on the cross the crucifixion then we have the day after and then the the third day we have we have the uh the the raising and the um appearance outside the tomb and it is very interesting that three days does seem to be it. A lot of people say to me though, well, you know, with some religions, people are buried um, within 24 hours. You, know, you just answered my religion. question. This is gonna be a oh, great interview. <laughs> I, I had a feeling that that might be something you were yes. thinking. And I know that puzzled me for a long time until I realized that the priests in many of these traditions are trained esoterically, um, deeply spiritually to guide the soul, to um, comfort the soul and assist through that journey, whether or not that is taking place um, almost immediately or not. So um, it is the the deeper inner work of the priest to be um, holding space for that process while it happens, irrelevant of whether or not the body is actually um, disposed of. So interesting. And, and you spoke about the spirit and the soul that you see in clockwise and anti-clockwise. For the audience, do you, or and probably for me, do you mind defining what that is and where does it go? <laughs> it, uh, wrong term, but... <laughs> where does it go? Well, it is a mystery, but I, I can explain it like this. This is what I see, mm -hmm. that it's like a DNA spiral almost, the, um, the, the two mm -hmm. energies together that are unbinding from each other. And the, when you look at it, it has the quality of, of sort of smoke almost. You can, 
you can see through it it's luminous it's ethereal it's there but it's um but it it's not solid so you can see see this happening and then eventually these two energies just disperse um into the room around us um eventually that will happen the interesting thing is that often the the, the spirit energy um which really represents the part the essence of the person who they were in this lifetime so it's you know did they love eating pizza did they love jazz did they love bright colors or did they like you know very quiet things and reading books all of that is condensed within the essence of who they were and that will be carried off within the spirit energy that's leaving the body and that often hangs around for a while and it's quite often said that even at funerals people have a sense of their of 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 the parted one coming and joining in and i've mm -hmm. seen this as well happen and i think this is an aspect of that spirit energy still just sort of filling the space still being around whereas the soul energy which has a much deeper and and heavier quality it it pulls away from the body and it 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 merges with the infinite that those are the best words that i can give to describe this it's very frustrating and um, that we don't really have good vocabulary for these mm -hmm. amazing things <laughs> um and so the words we use tend to sound awfully clunky and, and really kind of a bit wooden but when you see it it is the most transcendent experience ever and i must say it completely takes away your fear of death and your experience of death as well one of one of our biggest i mean fears ever is the fear of death why do you see in our well particularly in our culture we avoid talking about death and so many people are afraid of dying oh the the fear of death is it's enormous um and and you know i'm having to work again with this day in day out with people yes. trying to uh, loosen it release it let it go help people to let go of that that incredible grip they have on being alive at all costs i think i think it partly is because we have been severed with our connection to to the sacred and to to the things in life that we can't see yet are around us we we have really been turned inwards on that experience over the centuries and that is such a shame we've lost that sort of connection that we perhaps once had and i also think that for the last 60 years or so 70 years maybe most people don't die at home anymore mm. so we've lost that familiarity we don't have people dying around us and we don't know what dying looks like anymore we don't know what it sounds like what it smells like what somebody looks like when they're in the final stages of life because they're scooped up and probably taken to a hospital or hospice or whatever dying people are largely kept away from view mm -hmm. um, and unless you're a relative or, or a very close friend you won't see many dying people in your lifetime and i think the fear about it has grown up partly because it's been hidden from sight and um and almost made to be more frightening than it is so again I, I see part of my work is trying to really um bring out bring out what does happen and also to try and soothe fears as much as i can um gosh i've got lots of questions in my head to ask you um many people mediums and pe many people connect with loved ones days months years after you, after their death what are your thoughts on that i i think it's um a huge huge field to explore 
and I, um, I have had experiences myself um, where certainly um, uh, people I've worked with um, have, um, have made an impression on me and, and I have felt a connection with them that has survived. So certainly I, I believe that there is a survival of consciousness after death. I'm absolutely convinced of that, that death isn't the end. It, it just isn't. It's just yeah. one step um, in, in this journey we call life and beyond. And I, um, I have had some experiences that really make me um, completely resolute about that. So um, I think that our loved ones are literally a hair's breadth away from us and we may not see them uh, but we are often um, conscious of their presence around us and you know often and, and there will be different ways that that happens maybe a nudge or, or a synchronistic event such as a hearing some particular music or picking a book up and seeing something or or as what happens with many people birds animals will appear and will seem to um, um, have a connection with, the, with the, the loved one that's gone on. Robins, for instance, mm. are well known for, for their, for their um, role in that. So yes, I, I think this is a huge area to embrace. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, I'm asking a lot of you, have you seen, once you see the spirit, the soul, transition from the physical body have you seen any further than that where it goes or in consciousness um, yes i that's really hard to <laughs> i know it's a, hard, <laughs> it's quite it's, a hard question to answer but um i don't know exactly where but i do have a feeling of layers and levels and i feel that that as the soul progresses on its journey, um, it, it inhabits different layers and levels away from us. But it's so hard to describe this. I will tell you one story, which I, I do share occasionally. Yeah. I, worked, I worked with somebody for about eight months who was um, dying of um, lung cancer. And she was a wonderful woman who really was a huge teacher for me. And she was a Jungian psychotherapist, and she was also a lay priest within the Church of England. She had a very strong faith, but she'd also done an immense amount of, of depth work on herself. So she was really leading me along her dying journey, and I was learning so much from her. She was very, very good teacher used to tell me off sometimes and say, no, no, you've really got that bit wrong. Try a bit harder, you know, just try and see it from a slightly different way. Wonderful teacher. Anyway, um, eventually she, um, she died. And I remember it having a sort of feeling very sad that she'd gone because she'd been such an incredible teacher and, and friend as well. And um, a few days after she died, I was meditating and thinking about her. And suddenly she appeared in my mind's eye, mm -hmm. looking 30 years younger. She looked amazingly well. I remember now she had a sort of blue polo shirt on and she looked like she'd just been for a brisk walk. And she said, hello, I just want to say thank you so much for everything you did. And I said, oh, well, thank you. It was amazing. Can we please keep up the dialogue? Because... It was just so incredible and I want to know what happens next. And she said, no, that's, that's not for us to be doing. Yeah. And off she went. I was very sad because I felt, you know, it could have been the most incredible sort of friendship going from one side of the, of, of the threshold to the other. Anyway, something interesting happened because um, about 18 months later, she appeared again through meditation and she said can you please do something for me and I said of course I will try to if I possibly can and she said I would like you to create some sort of small ritual nothing too complicated to mark a rite of passage in the journey I've been on 
I really didn't have a clue what she meant. I just didn't really understand, but I went with it. So I said, yes, of course, guide me. And she said, use anything you like, but just to mark the this rite of passage that I now know what my that my new role is going to be. I have found the work I will be doing. I mean, I was completely astonished by this. So um, she gave me a few more instructions and I went to a wonderful place that she loved in life and just um, um, asked that everything would be, um, you know, um, released in love and that she would be um, on her way to the next work she was doing. I did it very privately, very quietly, no, no noise, no nothing, didn't tell anybody about this. But two weeks later, her husband rang me up and he said, can I have a, a very odd chat with you? And I said, of course. And he said um, that she'd been back and spoken to him and she now knew what she would be doing, what her soul work would be from now on. He'd had an identical conversation, oh, but he didn't know I, I'd had the same and, and vice versa. So I don't know what that shows us, but it shows us something. Yes. De well, death is not the end. That's, that's Death is not sure. the end. Sure. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that story. Well, since you are the expert, how, and it's not talked about, how can we support someone who is dying? Oh, well, there we are. Um, there are so many things, Louisa, that we can be doing. You know, once the doctors have said, I'm really sorry, there's not much that can be done now. That is the time when we can really come in and really do some deep uh, support work. Um, so um, there are a lot of things that we do as soul midwives, um, which are very um, to do with involving the, the, the five senses. So, so touch and sound um, and smell, not so much taste, but all, all the things that are very sort of gentle, very soft. So we work with, with color, we work with sound that's soothing and helps and reassures we do um, uh, breath work with people who are struggling with their breath. Um, we work with certain aromatic oils to um, help soothe their journey as well. There are lots and lots of things we can do to um, help um, take away some of the fear that's going on. And really, there are just a few little nuggets if you found yourself at the bedside as many of us will at some time in our life one of the things i would say to remember is immediately you're in the room with a dying person just slow right down slow right down slow everything down no harsh noises no jerky movements turn the lights down and then really offer deep presence and do this from the heart center um, and deep listening and do everything that you do, do it with absolute love, which is the key to working with people when they are dying, because they'll pick up and resonate with that energy um, more than anything else. So if somebody knows you're there and that you are holding space for them, with that heart connection and that things are quiet and peaceful and gentle, you can really, really help to um, enable someone to have a good death. So those, those would be my, my tips to pass on. Yeah, I'm so relaxed after saying that. Um, you also spoke about aromatherapy oils, which I know are very important for you. Do you mind sharing some of that yes, information um, with the audience? Absolutely. Um, so my practice as a soul midwife, um, which is it, it is very therapeutic, hands on work, the work that we do. But my practice is um, underpinned by um, work that I was introduced to many, many years ago when, when I was just 15. Not that long ago. In, well, <laughs> it was, trust me, it was <laughs> a long, long time ago. Mm -hmm. And I was living in Copenhagen in Denmark and I was taken to visit an extraordinary uh, woman who um, I was taken to have tea with her. She watched me like a hawk. She noticed all my um, expressions and 
and um, and she really tuned in to me. After tea, she picked all these bottles off her wall, tiny little bottles, little blue bottles. In fact, well, I've got the same sort of thing here. And she took some lids off and said, smell this, and then tell me, how does it make you feel? And I had the most amazing experiences smelling six or so of these oils. And it turned out in the end that she was a Myra for, which was um, the holder of, of the last of this lineage of working with sacred oils. And the lineage goes way, way, way back to at least the times of Mary Magdalene, who also worked with oils herself. And um, she took me under her wing and I was apprenticed to her for nearly four years. Um, it was grueling, hard. She was a monster of a teacher <laughs> I wanted to give up many times but never did and this has now been the foundation of of my work with the dying so I use certain oils again for their energy frequency and uh, the oils can work with the frequency of the person who's dying and again work mainly with soul wounds that are being experienced and helps to bring them up to the surface to be released so it's a really important part of my work that you did mention soul wounds which is in, in a whole other show probably but what how do you, so do you are you aware of individual soul wounds yeah Gosh. louisa absolutely um you know uh, another big part of the work as a soul midwife, we do very hands-on practical mm -hmm. things like holding hands and massage and mindfulness and breathing and, and feeding people's cats. You know, it's very practical work. Yeah. But we also do very highly um, um, tuned depth work on, on such things as soul wounds. And if you haven't come across the term before, you know, we all have them. We've all got something inside us that is a wound on a very deep level. You know, it could be um, abandonment. It could be a um, that we feel we're not being heard. We may have been born in the wrong body, the wrong gender. You know, there are all manner of soul wounds. And however much we work on them, uh, they are always just under the surface. Now, when we're dying, these naturally come up to the surface to be released. And part of the work of a soul midwife is to help that process, because the more we can release before we die, the um, easier it is for that transition to just be clear and pure. So that's a big part of the work. And the sacred oils have a real affinity with the soul wounds. So just to give an example, um, Raven Sara is a wonderful oil, which will bring up um, soul wounds caused by bullying or, or forms of abuse like that. Um, another one is violet, beautiful oil which I make and that works with very deep grief that people might be holding and a lot of older people as they're dying are holding grief within them that's been unexpressed and unprocessed so to release that um, as they're edging towards the end of life is an enormous burden to be released and shed and let down so you know they can let go of that then um, so it's, it's powerful work yes what wonderful work you're doing. Um, where's the, I, I will leave a link below in the show notes, but where's the best place for people to contact you? Oh, well, yes. So I have um, um, a school <laughs> based in the UK, but we have students from all over mm -hmm. the, the globe and lots is online called the Soul Midwives School. And it's um, www.soulmidwives, that's S-O-U-L, midwives.co.uk. And so I run lots, I do a lot of teaching about all aspects of death and dying and also the sacred oils. Wonderful, wonderful. What, what would be your advice for those that are afraid of death? Oh, I think to, to look at their life through the long lens and to see the timeline and to trace the timeline, see where things happened along that timeline that 
that can be healed and released. If I'm working with someone, I can do that with them. But you can do it yourself as well. Just look at your timeline and wherever you see something that's that's popping up, that's that's is challenging, heal and release that. And that will help you to then surrender to the process because greeting death and making friends with death is really about surrendering to that process and then being at ease with it. Every day I practice um, the fact that I am only temporary. I'm only in this temporary bo body and one day it will no longer serve me. So I work with that and um, encourage others to do that. It's very empowering and it, it gives you that sense of perspective as well, that we are spiritual beings having a human experience at the moment and the body it's just a nutshell, you know, it's just a shell that we cast off. So nothing to be frightened of <laughs> at and all. It, and, it, and for sure, it's going to happen to all of us at some point. Yeah, in it's going to happen to all of us. Absolutely. You, you speak about a safe journey home. What do you mean by that? And how can we try to yeah. have a safe journey home? A safe journey home. Well, in actual terms, we all really have a safe journey home. We are all looked after on that journey. Um, you know, whether or not you have a soul midwife with you, 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 you will always be held in safety as you're dying. You will be. You are never really alone. So having a safe journey home, I think, again, is this recognition that we are all going along this same journey and to, um, to work work with it rather than resisting it and to actually see it as a very enriching um, pathway that you're on you know to be edging towards the end of life sounds cataclysmic but you would be surprised at the the treasures that come along on the way um, inner knowing about things um, uh, connecting with others um, having reunions with people that perhaps you thought you would never see again there are all sorts of things that can make the journey towards death very rewarding and and very rich as well so i i, I try and see the safe journey home in those terms mm. um, i've just got two more questions if that's okay yeah. um you spoke about obviously before about seeing the soul and the spirit do you ever see other energies as in family members, uh, transition family members or angels or other spirits yeah. around the individual when they transition oh absolutely absolutely um w one of the things that i had to learn during my very lengthy apprenticeship to be a Myra for the woman who works with myrrh and this is going back to the sacred oils again one of the things I had to learn was to see energy so that was quite a, a big chunk of the learning and so when you are at the bedside and you are sitting and vigiling with someone who's towards the end of life you will often see or sense other people, other beings at the bedside. Now, often the person you're with, the dying person will also be seeing them. And um, it's always just such an amazing time when you're sitting there together and they're saying to you, can you see that horse that just came into the room? Yes, I can. <laughs> and I can feel him too. And if you're working with um, very acute energy and um, sensing as I am able to do, I, I have some amazing conversations with people who are dying, who are seeing these extraordinary things because their radar has expanded as they are less in their physical body and they are expanding out of it. This is where they're beginning to see all sorts of um, things or family members or beings of light or angels or colors swirling around their bedside. These are, this is the icing on the cake for a soul midwife <laughs> is seeing these wonderful um, beings as well. Yes. And it's also comforting to know for those, it's not a solitary experience. There are no. energies 
loved ones that have transitioned and potentially angels coming to help us transition yeah absolutely as much as we are a team on this side helping there is the team on the other side who are saying it's okay you're on your way we're ready to catch you so it's again this is where being a soul midwife is a lot like being a birth midwife in as much as we're there waiting to catch the baby um what that's what a birth midwife would be doing whereas the soul midwife is is handing over to the team on the other side who are ready and waiting always are wonderful um do you think maybe not on a conscious level we choose our point of time of death absolutely absolutely and that to me is one of the biggest mysteries ever um so often i work with somebody and really that against all odds they should be dead by now in as much as they're not eating they're not drinking they're hardly breathing but there is some reason why they are actually just hanging on for the perfectly right moment it um it could be <clears throat> that they're waiting for a loved one to come over from another country and visit that happens all the time or it could be that they're waiting for um, a special date in the calendar a 60th wedding anniversary or a special birthday to come up. Um, it could be all sorts of things. And this is what is such a mystery to me is that exactly when the time is right, then it will happen. And again, so often happens is that a family will have sat around the bedside for several weeks or days, never leaving mum on her own, holding her hand, you know, we're here, mum, we love you. Then they go out to have a meeting with the doctor or have a cup of tea or go to the loo and mum will die while they're gone because the room's empty no sort of complicated um attachment there so off she'll go because that moment is just free and of course to the family left behind that could be devastating you know oh no how could we have left her yeah. to die at that moment but no no that was exactly the moment she needed to just be able to go so i believe that is a mechanism inside us that can determine when that moment is so um it's yeah extraordinary yeah, that's I, sure. I think so too what for those loved ones left behind that are grieving what would you say to those that are grieving oh grief is is the price we pay for love that certainly is so true and grieving fills us with all sorts of uh, very tender emotions painful emotions it's love at its most painful but it does open us as well, I think, to receive yet more love and also to ripen our own souls. So grief is inescapable, but it does make us uh, riper souls, riper human beings in the end, I think. And it gives us some resilience and tools that isn't to take away, you know, if somebody is grieving, listening to this, my heart is with you, but it, it is a process. It is a human process that we go through. Um, and um, it's, it's an important one as well. So, and it takes as long as it takes. So never yeah. rush through it. <laughs> That's for well, sure. Thank you for that. Felicity, it's been such a delight to have you on the show. Is there anything you'd like to share with the passion harvest audience that i haven't asked you oh louisa <laughs> you've asked me some wonderful questions <laughs> um i i don't i can't think of anything off the top of my head but just um just to i have a mantra which is all is well and all will be well so you know just just put your faith in in whatever and 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 don't worry too much about end of life um there is a lot of um uh, invisible love out there which which will come your way and and you will be cocooned within it so i think to remember that might be helpful um uh, but it's been such a pleasure talking to you it really has and oh, it's I, been I a hope, pleasure. hope it's helped a bit <laughs> yes and what a beautiful that that mantra what a beautiful way to end the show thank you so much oh it's a great pleasure thank you so it, it, much as well. so felicity warner thank you so much for being on passion harvest it really was 
inspiring and insightful and delightful. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs> If you like this episode, please do subscribe for weekly passionate inspirational interviews.